You know, we're so glad that you're with us to worship, whether you're joining us on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, or on our church website. It's a thrill to worship together and sing to the King of Israel, the one who comes to make all things new. Speaking of making all things new, every year at Advent, we select a a partner, uh, locally or globally, who's focused on gospel mission uh, and making all things new through the power, love, and grace of Jesus to pray for, to tell their story, and to bless financially. And if you've been with us, you know our partner this year is Naomi's House. We've been so excited to tell you their story, and our goal is to raise $200,000 to bless them and their plans and their vision to create a second facility, a day program for these women who are in desperate need of the love and hope of Jesus. Now, we set a lofty goal of $200,000. Last week, you heard us say that somebody generously donated a $100,000 matching gift, and I'm thrilled to let you know that we're already at our goal of $200,000 as a church family. So praise God and thank you to all of you. Uh, It's not too late because every gift you give beyond this blesses Naomi's house even more and some of our other Serve the World partners. But uh, we just want to let you know how grateful we are to you and to God's provision and tell you the next portion of Naomi's house with this video. So the first time I was supposed to come to Naomi's house, I actually did the tour with Kim. And it was just her and I. I just immediately started bawling. I just felt just like this overwhelming feeling of just like when someone wraps their arms around you and you feel comforted. But being comforted was such a foreign feeling to me that I pushed it away. It freaked me out. I ended up running away and going back to my trafficker. That's when God heard my cry that I I couldn't do it by myself. If it wasn't for like the intervention of God taking that, that trafficker away from my life, I still would very much be active in the lifestyle of trafficking. For so long, she was familiar with all of those really heavy and negative emotions, loss, no one cared for her, she had no hope, she had no future, and she put a lot of trust into what we were saying. She was not easy some years. She was, (laughs) we had our moments when we really fought to keep her grounded here. It's how we communicate the love of God through real people loving them in a way that even when they're having a hard day or even when they're not having a pretty interaction with you. (laughs) Being able to to sit in that moment when they come back to you and say, I'm so sorry, and say, you know what, I forgive you, I understand, it's, it's, I still love you. There isn't anything that you can do that's going to stop me from loving you. And that's not something they've experienced before. That is unique to this place. I can't tell you how many times I packed my bags and unpacked them. I didn't know that choosing myself was okay because I was under the control of a trafficker who made everything about themselves. That was the hardest choice I ever had to make, to stick and stay here, to give myself a fighting chance. It's not as if someone's just gonna sit down and we're gonna say, God loves you, and you've got gifts and talents, and let's go get them. The women who work here just have this really unique ability to meet the residents where they are. And when the residents work hard to heal and take the resources like a program like Naomi's House offers, they heal that foundation and they can stand firmly on it. So I stopped asking God, like, why me? And just kept asking, like, okay, give me another brick. Just give me another brick so I can lay lay my foundation. This is a man who walked and sat at tables with prostitutes. This is the man who took that orphan and held him in his arms. That's exactly what Naomi's house does. That's what the staff does. They lean in. There's a lot of darkness, and you can get stuck in that, but there's so much hope in Even those small moments of change and those small moments of victory create so much hope. It's our privilege to come alongside them and show them the love of God because it's the most powerful thing we can do. Naomi's house is run by a group of women who love Jesus, who are far from perfection, but we know the living God. 
And if women at Naomi's house will walk alongside of us, we believe fully that we will all experience healing because of that. I never get tired of seeing those videos and hearing those stories. I hope it encourages you the way it's been encouraging us just to hear the stories of transformation. So profound. Did you hear what Kim said when she said there's a lot of darkness and you can get stuck in that, but there's so much hope and that's what we're about. And then when you heard uh, the comment that Naomi's house is run by a group of women who love Jesus, far from perfect, but they love Jesus. That's a description of the church, of who we are to be, far from perfect, but we love Jesus and we have hope in him. Let's pray before we jump in to the sermon text. Father God, there is a lot of darkness and there is a lot of bad news these days. And it's so good for us to be reminded that you are always at work, transforming lives, healing hearts, making all things new. Help us to fix our eyes on you, not just this season, but in all seasons, particularly right now as we open your word. Give us eyes to see what you have to show us and teach us. We pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, there's no, uh, no question that Christmas feels different this time of year. It just feels different. I mean, there's no getting around that. Many of us won't observe the traditions we're used to observing uh, for various reasons, maybe separated uh, from the miles and we can't travel because of COVID, or you're going to do a family Zoom Christmas, or uh, you're doing all your shopping online. Well, okay, that was happening uh, anyway before, but it just feels different. I talked to a woman just last week on the phone who, was, who had lost her mother right before COVID happened, and now her father is sick in the hospital, and she can't visit him and he can't be with her for Christmas and she's heartbroken. And it's easy to, as we just heard, to get lost in the bad news. It can be discouraging, but that's why it's so important that we come together as the body of Christ, even virtually, because we turn our hearts and our minds to the word of God, focusing on what what cannot be taken away, what we can never lose, what will never change, that Christ is real, that he has come into the world, that he will return, that he has defeated death on the cross, that he has resurrected from the grave, that he will restore all things. That's a, th- a hope worth holding on to with all of our strength in this season where everything seems to be shifting. We can hold on to Jesus. And in our series, Home for Christmas, that's what we're trying to do. Focus on the real, deep, spiritual, and biblical meaning of home. What does that mean? Let's read from John chapter 1, this uh, passage John describing, in theological terms, hope coming into the world. John chapter 1, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John's speaking in sweeping theological terms about Christ coming into the world, and he uses these images of light and darkness throughout the first three chapters of John. And this is a reference to Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse 2, where Isaiah says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those dwelling in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. And then Jesus picks up this theme in John chapter 8, verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. John, John chapter 1, says light has come into the world. The light of life, the true light, which gives life to all people. But not everybody sees it. Not everybody wants to see it. In fact, we're told that some reject. Jesus comes to his own people, the Jewish people, and they don't receive. They don't believe. They don't see by his light. This is what John means when he says the world did not know him even though he was in the world. Later in John 3, John will say, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness because their deeds are evil. The truth is, for many of us, we don't want to see by the light. We run from it sometimes. Light is given that we might see, as Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 1, he says that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we might see by the light of Christ, see ourselves See our neighbors, see the world, see truth clearly by his light. This is what C.S. Lewis means in one of my favorite quotes. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. I see Christ, I experience him, and because his light is in my, shining in my heart, I see the world differently now. It changes how I see. That's the purpose of light. Let's ask this question then. If John says not everyone received him, what does it look like to receive him? John says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The transforming power. 
Well, what does it look like to receive him? Is it just a matter of believing certain things? I mean, some of us grew up in churches where if you believe the right things, get your doctrine right, your theology right, just don't have any mistakes in what you believe, you believe accurately, then you're saved. Or is, are there magic words? Is there a special prayer you have to say in the right place, with the right posture, in the right order? Do you get the words right? Is that how it works? Or is it a combination? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, right? Believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess with our mouth that, that, that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Well, there's, what Paul is saying there is that our head and our mouth, they go together in our heart. We, there's a combination of these things. But it's more than that. It's, it's deeper than that. We use terms like saved, conversion, born again, new life inside the Christian bubble. And sometimes those words can be confusing to people. What they're really talking about when the light of Christ comes into a human heart, it changes everything. It transforms you. It transforms your life. These are just our ways of talking about a transformed life by the light of Jesus. And I, I want to take us to a New Testament story of a man who had an encounter with Jesus, which it's not really a Christmas story. We don't read it at Christmas time, but it does give us a powerful picture of what it means to receive the true light, which has come into the world to bring the light of life to all of us. It's a story uh, that might be familiar to some of you, though not at Christmas time. Stories in Luke chapter 19. It's a story of a man named Zacchaeus and his encounter with Jesus. Some of you, if you grew up in church, you might know a little song about Zacchaeus. He's the wee little man. Do you remember this? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. You didn't know Zacchaeus was Scottish, but now you do. I know, I couldn't help that joke. All right, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but not on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass by that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is an incredible story. If we just go back one uh, slide there to the beginning of Luke chapter uh, 19. Let's uh, observe a couple of things about this man Zacchaeus who may be familiar to us. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a, a chief tax collector. So he's a chief tax collector. That means he's uh, over a bunch of tax collectors. We'll come back to what that means in a minute. Uh, he was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. But he could not because he was small. <laughs> so he's a, a wealthy, ch important chief tax collector seeking Jesus, and he's small in stature. We'll come back to uh, some of the significance of those things and making observations about Zacchaeus in a moment. Now, we need to do some more historical background here to grasp the depth of meaning of this story. Uh, first of all, Israel at this time is under Roman occupation and rule. The story takes place in a city called Jericho. You'll see an image here of Jericho in just a moment. This is modern-day Jericho, a picture I took when we visited there. Uh, it didn't look anything like this in Jesus' day, this time of this story. The Judean hills, the wilderness there, is in the background. Behind and to the south would be the Dead Sea. Jericho was known as the City of Palms, a fragrant place it was called because of the palm and balsam trees that grew there. Josephus, the Jewish historian, said in all of Palestine, it was the richest and fattest uh, city in all of Palestine. So it's a wealthy city, a beautiful place to be. And Zacchaeus is a rich man living in a rich city, known for its, uh, its opulence and, and beauty. Um, it's a Roman colony. And because of its location along a trade route, it was a key center for taxation. Now, uh, Rome cared about two things. Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and paying taxes. Keep the peace and pay your taxes. And the way Rome handled taxation was they would, 
they would give the right to local people to be tax collectors and have the backing of the Roman military. So you had to buy that privilege. So Zacchaeus, it's like buying a franchise, would have to purchase the a tax right to be a collector. And he had other tax collectors underneath him. And the way he made money was he charged more than Rome required, and then he would basically extort his own people and get rich off the difference. Rome didn't care. As long as Rome, Caesar got his coin, they turned a blind eye to all the extortion going on. So you can understand, we've talked about this many times before, tax collectors were among the most hated people in all of Israel because they were worse than Romans. They should have known better. I mean, Romans were pagans, but tax collectors were Jews. They were sellouts to their own people. They were betraying their own people. So Zacchaeus, though he's rich, is probably a hated, no no question, a hated man in his community, isolated from the community of, of faith. So do you get the picture of Zacchaeus? A, a rich little cheat who nobody likes. And he hears that Jesus is coming. He hears that Jesus is making his way to Jericho. Now, we don't know why he wanted to see Jesus. Maybe it was purely intellectual curiosity. Maybe Zacchaeus, because of his isolation and loneliness and feeling like an outcast all his life, all of his money couldn't buy him the love he desired. Maybe he'd heard about this rabbi from Galilee. Maybe he'd heard about his mir- miraculous healings. Maybe he'd heard about his unusual teachings and he wanted to see him. He wanted to encounter him. He was seeking him. Wanted desperately to have some glimpse, some encounter with Jesus. And he reaches out for him and by, by doing so, by climbing a tree. And amazingly, Jesus reaches out to him. Think about that for a minute. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. He reaches out to this tax collector He stops and engages with him and comes to his house. This would have been unthinkable. But Jesus did this all the time. If you read through the Gospels, Jesus is always making time for the kinds of people that the rest of society didn't have time for. Dismissed, discarded. Those that were at the bottom, prostitutes, people that were poor, lepers, and people that were at the top of the socioeconomic scale, like Zacchaeus, wealthy. He cares about the people that most people don't or don't even see, don't even acknowledge, don't feel are worth their time. Now, we're told that Jesus did this for a particular reason. He did it because he came to seek and to save the lost. He says that in verse 10. The word lost comes from a a a Greek root word. It's apo, and it means literally to be in the wrong place, to be separated from. No question, Zacchaeus is separated from his community. But even more importantly, He's separated from God. He's distanced from God. And in that sense, he's lost. Do you know, I think it's possible to be in church and be distanced from God. It's possible to be surrounded by people and feel isolated and alone. In fact, that happens often in Christmas time. Many of us experience that during COVID. Lost means to be separated, isolated from fellowship, but ultimately from God himself. And Jesus says, I came to fix that. I came to to close that gap, to bring those who are separated and distanced and lost in. Isn't that powerful? And he does it for Zacchaeus. So what can we learn from what Zacchaeus does and the way this encounter happens? What does Zacchaeus do? Three things that we also can do to encounter Jesus to truly encounter the salvation Jesus brings. I came to seek and to save the lost, to have his saving power flowing through our lives. What what can we learn from Zacchaeus? The first first thing is get over yourself. (laughs) Just get over yourself, right? Get over yourself. What does this mean? Well, let's look at verses three through four again of chapter 19. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Zacchaeus climbs a tree. Why, why, what does this have to do with getting over yourself? You'll see here an image of a sycamore tree. Um, so it looks, it, uh, there weren't nice fences and gardens around him in Jesus' day, but it looks like it'd be fun to climb, doesn't it? Large tree, big branches. You can imagine somebody climbing up in that tree uh, to see over the crowd, and that's what Zacchaeus does. 
Now, I remember when my wife and son, I couldn't go, but when the Cubs won the World Series, seems like two lifetimes ago, but in 2016 when they were World Series champions and they beat the Cleveland Indians, shout out to Kenton Cober, our uh, worship pastor who loves Cleveland, um, who no longer is called the Indians anymore, but when the Cubs beat them, they were. Anyway, my wife and son went down uh, town Chicago for the parade, the celebration parade. Hundreds of thousands of people, people climbing trees and lampposts. Why? To get a glimpse. And it's okay in that situation, but... In this day and age, for a grown man to climb a tree was terribly undignified. Even today, even today, if we were, uh, say you're in D.C. and you see uh, somebody, uh, a senator or somebody climbing up into a tree, it, w- it would make the news. Is, what is he doing? Why is he up there? You know, it's undignified. It's beneath the level of his stature. And that was certainly true in a formal, traditional culture. Zacchaeus would have made a spectacle of himself, embarrassed himself. But he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus, so he's willing to climb the tree. Get over himself, get over his pride, get over his dignity, get over his self-importance. You know, it's okay for children to climb trees, but not for adults. Or is it? For Zacchaeus, his desire to meet Jesus was greater than his need to look respectable or acceptable. How relevant is that for us today? Is your desire to meet Jesus greater than your need to look acceptable to the people around you or respectable in society. You cannot have the saving power of Jesus Christ flowing through your life if you're afraid of appearing foolish. G.K. Chesterton said there's no more foolish or childish thing than the fear of being perceived as foolish or childish. Isn't that good? There's no more foolish thing than the worry about somebody else thinking you're foolish. We need to get over ourselves if we're going to meet Jesus. This is what Paul means when he says that we are fools for Christ in 1 Corinthians. I mean, the world looks at us and thinks, fools. It makes no sense. You really believe that? As a matter of fact, in the Narnian Chronicles, uh, you remember the four children that C.S. Lewis wrote about in the Chronicles of Narnia. You've got Edmund and Peter and Lucy, the youngest, and then the, the older daughter, the older uh, girl, excuse me, Susan, Susan Pevensey. In the last battle, the last book, we're told something sad about Susan, that she's not able to come into Aslan's country, the image of heaven. And the reason is she's no longer a friend of Narnia. Why? Lewis says it's because she's become too, quote unquote, grown up. She cares only about lipstick and nylons. Remember nylons? Meaning she's grown up and no longer believes those childish, silly fairy tales anymore. Some have criticized Lewis for this and said that he's somehow uh, a misogynist. They totally miss his point. The point he's trying to make there is part of what it means to encounter Jesus is believing in the supernatural. Believing that transformation is possible. Believing that a virgin could give birth to the Son of God. Believing that God could raise a man from the dead. Believing that he ascended to heaven. You believe that? You kind of have to get over yourself to believe that. The mistake that Lewis made himself for many years as a young atheist and that many people today make is to think you got to grow up and grow out of those childish things. You know, hold on to the moral lessons about Christianity, but let go of all the the supernatural stuff, the miraculous stuff. No, that's above all things what you have to hold on to. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 25, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It's incredible. It's an incredible passage. The essence of the gospel is foolishness to those who don't understand, who have not received him, who have not believed in his name. So the question I think before we move on is, are you willing to lay aside your need to look respectable, acceptable? Are you willing to look like a fool to others in order to encounter Jesus? Zacchaeus was. The second thing Zacchaeus does and that we must do to encounter Jesus is get over the crowd. 
First, get over yourself. Second, get over the crowd. What does this mean? Well, if the first obstacle for many of us to encountering Jesus is our own pride and our own dignity, I think the second obstacle, and I see this so often for many of us to encounter Jesus, is other people. Quote, unquote, the crowd. Let's look at verse, Luke 19, verses 4 through 6. So he ran ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he's about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Get over the crowd. What is the crowd? The crowd is the moralistic, self-righteous, religious people. Often, sadly, church people. I can't tell you how many times I've encountered people who've said something like this. Look, if Christianity produces people like that, then I don't want anything to do with it. I hear that over and over and over again, often from the younger generation. If that's what I have to be like to, be a, a, to follow Jesus, then I don't want any part of it. I wish I didn't have to say this as a pastor, but I, I, I do I need to apologize for those of us sometimes in the church who are part of the moralistic, self-righteous crowd. But you must get over the crowd if you're going to encounter Jesus. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi famously said, it, said that he loved Christ, but he wasn't so sure about those Christians. He said, I love your Christ. It's those Christians I'm not so sure about. Now, that's not true for all Christians, but I think for many people, it's the behavior of those who claim to follow Jesus that keep them from encountering him. And that's a tragedy. That is a tragedy. You must find a way. You must get a vantage point where you can see Jesus apart from the crowd. You must encounter him for yourself. Most of you need to do exactly this. And even if you've been in the church for a while, you need to do this. How? How do you do this? Well, simply by coming to the Gospels, by bringing your heart and your mind back to Scripture. You encounter Jesus, the Word made flesh, in the Word, the written Word. He is the living word. The way you encounter him is read who he is, what he said, what he did. Don't just listen to other people's opinions about him or what, what the latest tweet is about him. Don't, don't let the behavior of those who claim to follow him keep you from coming to meet him yourself. And if you do, you'll find that um, Jesus, in, in the scriptures, is every bit as down on the moralistic, self-righteous crowd as you are, even more so. Do you know throughout the, the gospel accounts, anytime Jesus encounters somebody who's at the low end of, of the social scale, who's poor, who's physically hurting in some way, who's sick, who's broken, who's been betrayed, who's outcast, he's tender, he has compassionate. Those who are weighed down by sin, even when he's trying to change their life and redirect them, He's tender and gracious with them. The only time Jesus rails and thunders in anger, do you know when? It's to the moralistic, self-righteous, religious people. That's who he reserves his harshest words. The crowd can be a barrier to those of us that have been around the church a long time. Uh, for those of us who are committed Christians as well, but we've been around the church for a long time, people uh, in church are, I see this all the time, basing their beliefs. I see it in many of you. Basing your beliefs in what your favorite Christian author is tweeting, what your favorite Christian blogger is uh, saying or writing, what uh, your, the celebrity pastor is, is preaching or posting. Christian people on social media or, or people that claim the name of Christ and are putting out all kinds of stuff and sometimes, don't get me wrong, I follow lots of people, I listen to lots of podcasts. I'm not saying that can't be helpful. It can be. But again, to encounter Jesus, we sometimes we need to get over even the Christian crowd, even the Christian social media crowd, and come back to the scriptures and meet him personally here. I think we all need to do this. The best way for any of us to do this is to bring our hearts and minds back to the word of God, centered on Christ. The Bible, all the Bible, all, from Genesis to Revelation, it all testifies to him, is about him, points forward to him, back to him, puts our hope in him, is a witness to him. Jesus said this in Luke 24, that all the scriptures are pertaining to who he is and what he has done and will do. Okay, so first two things. Some of us just need to get over ourselves. 
our own need to keep, to be respectable. Maybe, maybe you've ever felt, uh, I don't know, a little apologetic about your faith. Maybe you've got friends. I remember talking to a man who said he had friends at work. And when they found out he was a Christian, they would ask him questions like, do you really believe such and such? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? And he found himself over time kind of worn down and said, well, well, and when to qualify when he realized, yes, I do. I do believe that. The first thing is to get over ourselves. Second, to get over the crowd. And I would just put it to you. What kind of crowd is in your way? Maybe, maybe you've been hurt by some Christians. Maybe some people in your past who claim to love Jesus have done awful things. And you've watched them behave in ways that were really hurtful. Well, I'm sorry that happened. God is sorry that happened. But don't let that keep you from encountering Jesus. Maybe some of you have been around the church for a while, but you've stopped meeting Jesus and you're trying to live vicariously through somebody else's relationship with him. You need to get over the crowd and come back to who he really is. Okay, third thing. If you want the salvation of Jesus Christ, remember he said, I came to seek and to save the lost, those who are separated, who are distanced. If you want that in your life, and some of you are listening going, well, I'm already saved. I'm already a Christian. Don't be so sure that you too can't be distanced from God and need to be brought back. The third thing, you need to let him in. Let him in. Let's go back to the story, Luke 19, verses 7 through 10. And when they, this is the crowd, saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. You hear how, how condescending they are? How judgmental they are? And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, we're told that when Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Come down, for I must stay at your house, Zacchaeus hurries down and welcomes him, receives him joyfully. The crowd says he's going to be the guest of a sinner. And when he says the guest, it's not like Jesus is just stopping by like unannounced. The, the whole implication here is he's coming over to stay for a while. He's coming over to Zacchaeus' home, into the center of his home. Um, I don't know what you're like about your home, but you, know, you don't just let anybody in your home. Um, the people that come into your home, that's coming into the center of who you are. Um, and I remember when I was a kid, you know, we'd have company come over and we had to put on our best, right? Clean the house and make it all look nice because people are coming over, coming in. Jesus is coming over. He's coming in. And the home simply means the center, the core of who Zacchaeus is. He's coming into the center of his life. He's not having a conversation on the periphery, you know, out in the city streets and then, hey, good to see you. Think about these things. I'll catch you later, Zacchaeus. No, coming into the center of his life, into his home. Two key implications here. The first one is, we'll call it the order of grace. The order of grace. This is so important. Notice what happens. Zacchaeus does not say, I'm going to pay everyone back for all of my cheating and defrauding them as a tax collector. I'm going to pay it all back. I'm going to pay it all back fourfold. I'm going to give half of my possessions away. And then Jesus goes, ah, oh, what an honorable man. Now you're worthy. Since you've decided to do that, Zacchaeus, I will come over. That's how most of us think that religion works. I give God my best. And it might not be good enough, as good as he is, but maybe it's good enough on the scale like God grades on a curve. And then he looks and goes, okay, since you're trying so hard, I'll come in now. You know, I, I, I pray, I go to church, and I try to love my neighbor. You know, on that note, we talk around here at Chapel Street Church about loving our neighbor. We talk about being a family of neighborhood churches, wanting to bless our neighbors with our presence in their lives and in the community. And that's true. But don't make the mistake of thinking that loving your neighbor is the way you earn salvation, is the way that God lets you into his family. That's not how it works. Notice what happens. Jesus says, I'm coming over. Before Zacchaeus does a thing, he hasn't repented. He hasn't confessed. He hasn't even invited Jesus in. Did you notice that? Most of us think that it works like, you know, you have to decide. Well, I'll decide, Jesus, if we're going to let you in. I recently installed a ring doorbell, ring on a camera doorbell on our door. And so we're getting the buzz all the time to see who's there delivering packages on my phone. I can always see who's coming up to the door. It's, it's a little bit creepy, but kind of fun also. But it, we think it looks like that. Oh, look, look, Jesus is out there. Should we let him in? We'll decide. That's not how it works. Jesus says, I must come to your house. I'm coming over. I'm coming in. 
He's not even invited. But Zacchaeus welcomes him in, receives him joyfully. This is so crucial. We get the order right. The order of grace is this. First, salvation. Then, a changed life. First, Jesus comes to you. And when you, as John says in John chapter 1, receive him and believe in his name, then he begins to transform you. It's not you clean up your act, love your neighbor, be kinder to your children, be better to your spouse, go to church more often, pray more, read the Bible more, and then God goes, good enough, now I'll let you in. No. First, Jesus comes to you, just as you are. We say around here, for where you are, that's what that means. Wherever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever you're into, Jesus comes to you. I want to come in, he says. I must stay. I want to come in and stay. Will you welcome him? Will you let him in? So first, the order of grace. Second, the results of grace. Zacchaeus announces he's going to give half of his possessions away to pay back those he cheated. Jesus does not say, now salvation's come to this house. When he says that, he's not saying because of that. He's saying, look, because salvation has come to this house, meaning this man's life, that's what he means by house, you can see it in what he does. The order of grace first is that salvation first comes, the grace of Jesus first. But when the grace of Jesus comes into the center of who you are, it always leads to a transformed life. Always. Uh, Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, says one of the surest signs of grace at work in us are the thoughts that no longer occur to us. Think about that for a minute. What he means is there used to be things that were hang-ups for you, areas of sin you were stuck in, areas of uh, mental defeat, um, difficulty, brokenness that were just, you felt stuck and you couldn't get rid of them mentally or emotionally. And then over time, God begins to heal you. He begins to break up the hardness of your heart. He begins to free you from those things. And you look back and realize, you know, that used to be my issue and it's not anymore. It changed life, transformed life. It doesn't mean all at once, every impulse to do wrong is gone. But the story is telling us that if Jesus has truly come in, he will inevitably begin to do his work. Again, C.S. Lewis has a famous little story where he talks about this. He says that when Christ comes into our life, uh, he begins to rearrange things. Not just rearrange the furniture a little bit, not just to do a little add-on, a little addition, a little remodeling. He begins to tear down walls, throw up towers, and redo the whole thing. And it's disorienting, and it can be painful. And we thought he was going to make a little cottage, but he's building a palace. Why? He intends to dwell there. He wants to do that in you, and in me, and in us as his church. That's what he's after. Remember that the home and the family table in the ancient world are, are very significant symbols of the center of your life. Jesus was not just casually dropping by for Zacchaeus. He's coming to the center of who, is, who he is. This is what it means to come home for Christmas. Jesus comes to make his home with you and with me and with us. If you want the salvation and the power of Christ flowing through your life, it means you can't keep him on the periphery. I've tried this for years. You know, you can, you can, you can have this part of the house, Jesus. You can have this part of my life. Can you imagine if Zacchaeus said that? Well, you know, how about just the front porch? How about just you stay in this corner? No. He's either coming in or he's not. And he wants to come in. It means you let him in to the very center of who you are, the center of how you think about your money, your resources, your time, your relationships, your work, your career, your children, everything. Does Jesus Christ have access to rearrange all of it? Is he allowed to transform how you think about your relational world, even your political ideology? Does he have access and does he have rights to transform you in every possible way? I think we're all holding out on him in some way, in some area. We're all not letting him in somewhere. The message here is, if you want to encounter the saving grace of Jesus Christ, you need to get over yourself. You need to get over your own pride and dignity. And you need to get over the crowd. Don't let other people's behavior, beliefs, thoughts, attitudes, and actions keep you from coming to Jesus. And then finally, you need to let him in. Let him all the way in. Because that's when he does his work.
Remember that we're told that Zacchaeus hurried down and received him joyfully. Friends, today, can you imagine that you're on that road in Jericho, that Jesus turns to you and he calls your name and he says, come down because I'm coming over. I want to come in. Will you welcome him joyfully? Will you let him in? What better time than Christmas, than this season, for you to say, Jesus, I've been holding you at arm's length. I've been keeping you out, but I need you to come in. I want you to come in. That's what he wants. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for this ancient story which has so much profound relevance for us today. And Lord, I I know there are people watching and listening right now who know they have not let you in, who are struggling to get over themselves, over the crowd, and they know that you are on the outside. God, I pray that by your spirit right now, they would hear you say, call their name and say to them that you want to come into their lives and transform them. God, I pray that they would know that they don't have to get their life right. They don't have to get their act together. They don't have to clean up all of the brokenness of their life. You will do that if they will but welcome you in. Thank you, Jesus, that you come to us, not just at Christmas time, but at all times. We give you all the praise and glory. It's for your name, and in your name we pray. Amen.